Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we bring you another in the series of famous jury trials. Each week at this same hour in Radio Court Hall, a brilliant cast reenacts for you a real-life case taken from actual court history. In this series, you'll hear the most stirring trials, great attorneys, famous prosecutors, not fiction but fact, the truth, sometimes pitiful, sometimes humorous. Tonight's broadcast was prepared under the legal guidance of the well-known New York attorney, Martin H. Young. Fictitious names of people and places are used, and such changes are made as necessitated by limitations of time and to protect the identities of persons involved. The trial you'll hear reenacted now was one of the most sensational that ever occurred. Mrs. Claire Davis, a very good-looking, red-headed woman in her early 30s, is charged with poisoning to death 70-year-old Jerome Robeson in order to inherit his money. In addition, the state charges that Mrs. Davis was responsible for murdering by poison three other elderly men in order to get their money. More than 50 witnesses appeared in the actual trial, but their testimony will be condensed in this reenactment. Now, the judge has entered Radio Court Hall, and the trial with the jury of women as well as men is about to begin. The state versus Clara Davis... Mr. District Attorney, open for the state. Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the state today charges Mrs. Clara Davis specifically with the murder of Jerome Robeson. But in addition, we will show that Mrs. Davis poisoned to death three other elderly men, making her a murderess not once, but four times over. Upon proof of these multiple murders, and particularly on the charge of killing Jerome Robeson, we will ask your verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree. <laughs> Call Mrs. Sarah Berman to the stand. Mrs. Sarah Berman, take the stand, please. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yeah, I do. Be seated. Mrs. Berman, do you know Jerome Robeson? Yeah. He lived in the apartment across the hall. He used to keep his door open so I could go in a few times a day and see that he was all right. Did you ever see the defendant, that red-haired woman, Mrs. Clara Davis? Yeah. I see her the first time a month before he died. Explain that. Well, she rang my bell and asked me if an old man lived in the house. Not Mr. Robson, just an old man. Then she looked to the open door across the hall and... When she see Mr. Robeson there, she turned round and walk right in. After that, she came to see him every day. Did Mr. Robeson ever talk to you about her? Uh, yeah. He told me a few weeks after that she was his niece and that he was going to give her all his money to invest for big interest. Now, what happened on Wednesday, September 14th? Oh, my goodness. Mr. Robeson was sick in the morning with a heavy cold. I called the doctor and he came at 11 o'clock in the morning. He leaves some tablets and... He said Mr. Robson would be fine in a day or two. Go on, Mrs. Berman. Well, at 12 o'clock, that red-headed Mrs. Davis come, and I saw her give him lunch and a glass of something to drink. She went away, and then at 2 o'clock, Mr. Robson called me, and he says, Oh, Mrs. Berman. Oh, Mrs. Berman. Mrs. Berman, get me some water. My insides are burning up. Oh, that's oh. terrible, Mr. Robson. Oh. How long you feel like that? Oh, ever since Mrs. Davis gave me dinner. Please, Mrs. Berman, I'm choking, choking. Well, the doctor come and he say Mr. Robson was dead. Oh, but the same doctor said he was all right at 11 o'clock in the morning. Thank you, Mrs. Berman. You may oh, take God. the witness for cross-examination. <laughs> Mrs. Berman. Did Mr. Robeson seem happier than ever before during the month Mrs. Davis started to take care of him? Yeah, he did. Are you absolutely sure Mrs. Davis was at the house that Wednesday when he died? I'm sure. I saw. And he was all right until she come. <laughs> you may leave the stand. <laughs> Call Dr. Boone to the stand. Dr. Boone, take the stand, please. 
Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Be seated. Dr. Boone, did you examine Jerome Robeson at 11 o'clock on the morning of Wednesday, September 14th? Yes, the man had a cold. I left him some tablets and expected him to be quite recovered within a few days. Mrs. Berman called you back later in that day? Yes, I went back at 2 o'clock. Robeson was dead, but I could not determine the cause of death. Later, I helped perform an autopsy and found enough arsenic in his body to poison four men. That's all, Doctor. You may cross-examine, Counselor. Dr. Boone, 72-year-old Jerome Robeson was sick when you examined him that morning? Yes, but not seriously. I didn't ask for any qualifications. Was there any arsenic in those tablets you gave him? Yes, there probably was a very minute quantity of arsenic in the tablets. That's all, Doctor. Leave the stand. Call police Captain White to the stand. Police Captain White, take the stand, please. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Be seated. As captain of detectives, you were called to Mr. Jerome Robeson's apartment on the afternoon of Wednesday, September 14th? I went there, all right. We had the old man's body removed, and I found this will under his pillow, leaving all his money to his niece, Mrs. Clara Davis. She really wasn't his niece, but Never we... mind that right now, Captain. I offer this will in evidence. It may be marked. Mark State Exhibit 1. Did you see Mrs. Clara Davis that day? Yes. I found that bottle of arsenic in her house that afternoon. I offer this bottle of arsenic in evidence. It may be marked. Mark State Exhibit 2. Counselor, take the witness. Captain White, you broke into Mrs. Davis's house and proceeded to turn the house upside down. You grilled her, insulted her. Told her you were out to get her, didn't you? No, nothing like that. Where did you find that bottle of arsenic? Down the cellar toward the back of a shelf. Did Mrs. Davis ever admit that the bottle belonged to her? No, of course she didn't. That's all, Captain White? Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your courtroom announcer. Because of lack of time, we will condense the testimony of the next witnesses. The first witness was a chemist who said... My analysis showed that a blue handbag belonging to the defendant contained in the lining a number of white arsenic crystals. Then a bank clerk in the bank where Jerome Robeson had his account said that... On Thursday, September the 15th, as soon as the bank opened, Mrs. Clara Davis came in with a check for $1,500 signed by Jerome Robeson. The check was made out in pencil and was badly smudged, so I told her she'd have to get a new check. And Fifteen minutes later, she came back with a new check. And because of the large amount, I decided to telephone Mr. Robeson, and I found out that he was dead. I told Mrs. Davis I was going to report it, but she asked me... Please don't report that to the police. I didn't know Mr. Robeson was dead. I was just get, getting the money for him. I have a 12-year-old boy, and it would be terrible for him if he were arrested. Please, please. And so, for the sake of her little boy, I decided to keep quiet. I kept the check, but after she was arrested, I turned the check over to the police. Now, maybe I should have... Then two handwriting experts testified that both the check and the will were forgeries written by the defendant. And then came testimony as sensational as ever heard in a courtroom, as the state attempted to connect Mrs. Davis with the death of three other old men who had died a few months apart. Witnesses said that these men... 68-year-old Elmer Walker died in the hospital here of arsenic poison. He was traveling with Mrs. Clara Davis and her little boy. Elderly Mr. William Rundbeck died today. Autopsy revealed a large quantity of arsenic in his organs. He left his money to Mrs. Clara Davis, who was... A few hours after dinner tonight, Mr. Harry Westerman, 71 years old, died from arsenic poisoning. He had dined with Mrs. Clara Davis, whom he knew well. The next witness, 68-year-old Fritz Luckner, was brought into court in a wheelchair and gave his testimony while attended by a nurse. The district attorney is questioning him as I return you to Radio Court Hall. And you know the defendant, Mrs. Clara Davis? Yes, sure I know her. She tried to kill me like all the others. Objection! Right out all but the word sure. Tell us about it, Mr. Lutner. Uh, she called on me about a year ago. She said her father used to know me or, or something like that. She told me she could invest my money and bring me back interest with it. I'll bring you back big interest on your money, Papa Luckner. I'll show you how to enjoy your money right away. Why, you can go traveling, you can have more expensive things. Oh, let me invest it for you. Let me have it. Oh, I kept giving her my money until until she had $2,500 of mine. Go on, Mr. Luckner. Uh, then she invited me to her house for dinner. She kept putting a lot of salt on my food. But it made the food taste 
sweet instead of salty. I went right home after dinner, and when my inside started burning. The doctor told me I had arsenic poisoning. And what is your physical condition since then, <laughs> Mr. Luckner? Yeah. I will never be able to walk again. My whole right side is paralyzed. Yeah, but at least I, I am not dead like the others. Take the witness for cross-examination. Mr. Luckner, didn't you suffer from stomach trouble during the past few years, long before you met the defendant? Yeah, yeah, a little. But I, I never was paralyzed until that dinner. That night? Both she and her son ate the same food with you, didn't they? I only know that I got poisoned. I don't know what they all did. All right, all right, Mr. Luckner. No more questions. The state rests. Your Honor, I move for a dismissal of the charges against the defendant on the grounds that... The defense motion is denied. We will hear all the evidence. But at this time, I declare a brief recess, after which this court will reconvene. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is your courtroom announcer speaking from the corridor of Radio Court Hall. While the court is in recess for a moment, let's review the state's case against Mrs. Clara Davis. You remember the first direct evidence against her was given by Mrs. Berman, who said that Jerome Robeson called out to her. Oh, Mrs. Berman, Mrs. Berman, get me some water. My insides are burning. Oh, that's terrible, Mr. Robeson. How long you feel like that? Ever since Mrs. Davis gave me dinner. Oh, that moment, what did she do? Then you recall the doctor said... I performed an autopsy on Robeson and found enough arsenic in his body to poison four men. Next, police captain White testified that... I went to Mrs. Davis' house that afternoon. I found that bottle of arsenic in the house. And then when the bank clerk testified that the defendant had tried to cash a forged check, he told how Mrs. Davis pleaded with him. Please. I was only getting the money for Mr. Robeson. I didn't know he was dead. Please. I have a 12-year-old boy, and it would be terrible for him if I were arrested. Please. Please. And then followed in rapid succession testimony concerning other deaths. 68-year-old Elmer Walker died in the hospital here of arsenic poisoning. Elderly William Runbeck died today. Autopsy showed a large quantity of arsenic. Shortly after dinner tonight, Harry Westerman, 71 years old, died of poisoning. And that testimony was climaxed when crippled old Fritz Luckner accused the defendant of poisoning him. And he told reporters during the recess that he... Look at me. Look at me. I'm crippled. Paralyzed. And that woman did it. She put poison in my food. She tried to kill me like all the others. But I fooled her. Yeah. I'm alive to send her to the electric chair. Yeah. I fooled her. What will her defense be? We'll soon know, for you'll hear her story from her own lips when she takes the stand. So now I return you to Radio Court Hall, where the defense attorney is already making his opening address to the jury. We will show you that this mother of a 12-year-old boy is a kind, simple human being like you and me. We shall smash the state's evidence and reveal her innocence so completely that I am sure you will acquit her. Call Dr. Hunter to the stand, please. Dr. Hunter to the stand, please. <coughs> Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Be seated. Dr. Hunter, what is your particular field of specialization? I'm a toxicologist. I've examined over 20,000 persons in relation to poison. I've conducted over 250 post-mortem examinations. Now, Dr. Hunter, you've heard describe the symptoms of those elderly gentlemen who died. Would you say that those symptoms necessarily indicated arsenic poisoning? Definitely no. And those symptoms might have been caused by a variety of other things. Now then, just what procedure do you consider necessary to make a diagnosis of arsenic poisoning? It's necessary that there be a complete chemical analysis of every single portion of the body. Uh, that was evidently not done in these cases. Now, Doctor... Mr. Luckner testified that the salt gave his food a sweet taste. Does arsenic have a sweet taste? It does not. Arsenic is practically tasteless. Furthermore, concerning the arsenic found in the handbag, isn't it possible that the lining material in the handbag naturally contained arsenic? That's not only possible, but probable. Many thanks, Dr. Hunt. Your witness for cross-examination, Mr. District Attorney? Dr. Hunter... 
In all those 250 dead bodies you examined, did you make a complete chemical analysis in every single case? Well, no. Yet on many of those bodies where you did not make a complete analysis, did you still make a diagnosis of arsenic poison? Oh, yes, you see You that. stated that the symptoms surrounding the deaths of these elderly men might have been caused by other things. But don't they also in every case indicate a strong possibility of arsenic poisoning? Yes, they do. Now... Even if it were possible that the materials in the handbag naturally did contain arsenic, could that really account for the actual grains of arsenic found in the handbag? Uh, well, uh, no. That will be all. The next defense witness was 12-year-old Jimmy Davis, son of the defendant. On his way to the witness stand, Jimmy ran over to his mother. They threw their arms around each other, and they both wept bitterly. The boy was then led to the witness stand and sworn in while still crying. The defense attorney is examining him as we return you to Radio Court Hall. You studied the Bible, and you know it's wrong for little boys not to tell the truth? Yes, I know that. All right. You know that woman, the defendant? Yes, sir, that's my mother. Look to me. Did you ever see this bottle of arsenic marked State Exhibit 2? Yes, that's my bottle. My friends and me had a chemistry club. We went around to hospitals and drug stores and got the old bottles they threw out. That bottle was one of them. And where did you keep the bottle, Jimmy? I kept it on a shelf in the cellar where the policeman found it. Did you ever visit Mr. Jerome Robeson with your mother? Yes, lots of times. He told me he thought she was an angel. Mother cried something awful when he died. And do you remember the last night that Mr. Fritz Luckner had dinner at your house? Yes. I remember. We all ate the same thing. And how did you feel after dinner, Jimmy? Well, I felt just dandy. Mother's a wonderful cook. All those men who ever came to our house for dinner always said so. Thank you, Jimmy. Take the witness, Mr. District Attorney. Jimmy, this bottle of arsenic. Did you have any others just like it? Sure I did. Can you say for certain that this bottle is the same one that you used in your chemistry club? No, I... I couldn't be sure. The night Mr. Luckner got sick, were you served from one big plate on the table? No. Mother always brought in separate plates. So your mother brought in Mr. Luckner's plate. Then she went back to the kitchen and brought in your plate. Is that right? I think so. Now, think hard, Jimmy. Did you use any salt that night? Gosh, I, I don't know, mister, but... I know Mummy wouldn't do anything wrong. Don't, don't cry, Jimmy. You may leave the stand. Call Mrs. Clara Davis to the stand, please. Mrs. Clara Davis to the stand, please. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Be seated. Mrs. Davis, just give us a few brief facts about your past life. Well, I... I was married when I was 18 years of age. A year later, my little boy was born. When Jimmy was five years old, my husband died. I brought up Jimmy ever since. How did you support yourself and your little boy, Mrs. Davis? Well, people said I had a good business sense. I I bought and sold property. I handled investments for others for a commission. Tell us about your relationship with Mr. Jerome Robeson. Well, I I was introduced to Mr. Robeson a few years ago. I, I didn't see him again, though, until a friend of mine in Europe wrote to me enclosing a letter for Mr. Robeson, whose address he didn't know. I looked him up and delivered the letter. So your real acquaintance with Mr. Robeson dated from the time you delivered that letter? Yes. He was a lonely old man. I I just tried to be friendly. Later, he asked me to invest some money for him. He said, now, Clara. Uh, now, Clara, like we were talking yesterday, I... I want you to be like a niece to me and to take care of my money from now on. Uh, here's a check for $1,500. But that's a lot of money. Oh, it's all right, Clara. You put the money in the checking account in your name. Then you can use it to buy me things and pay my bills, you see. And then he, he gave me that check on Tuesday, September 13th. And did you see Mr. Robeson the next day, Wednesday the 14th, as Mrs. Berman testified? No, she lied. She lied. I wasn't there that day. Mr. Robeson was supposed to come to my house to have dinner, but he didn't come, so I didn't see him all day Wednesday. 
And then on Thursday, I I went to the bank to cash the check and open, open a checking account. When the clerk told me the check was no good because it was smudged, I I simply made out a new check and signed his name. I, I was going to spend the money for him anyhow. It was his money. And you didn't know at that time that he was dead? No, I didn't. All right, Miss Davis. Now, how about the arsenic bottle? I never saw that bottle before. I told the police it belonged to Jimmy, but they wouldn't believe me. How did the police treat you? They broke into my house. They threw everything upside down. They said they were going to pin this death on me if it was the last thing they did. Now, what about that will? I didn't write that will. I never saw it before. I was surprised to learn that he left me his money. Did you know the other men who have been brought into the case, the men who died? Elma Walker, William Runbeck? Harry Westerman? I had nothing to do with their deaths. It, it only happened that I handled their investments. Those accusations are all lies. The police are trying to frame me. And what about Fritz Luckner? <laughs> Mr. Luckner ate exactly the same food as Jimmy and me. If he was poisoned by my food, then, then we'd all have been poisoned. <laughs> I had nothing to do with his illness. <laughs> Take the witness for cross-examination. <laughs> Mrs. Davis, you did have dealings with each of those four old men who died of arsenic poisoning, didn't you? Yes, but I did You fed Fritz Luckner a meal, a few hours after which he became violently ill. And to this day, he's crippled and paralyzed from the effects of that food. He had dinner at my house, but I didn't poison him. I didn't. Why not accuse me of poisoning all the old men in the country? Strike <laughs> that out. Mrs. Davis, I must warn you to control yourself. I'll try. Mrs. Davis. Let's get to the case of Jerome Robeson. You did pose as his niece, didn't you? Well, he liked to call me his niece. It, it was an old man's pleasure. But you did write the will leaving all his money to you, didn't you? I did not. I didn't know there was such a will. You did try to cash this check. And when the check was rejected, you signed a new check forging his name, didn't you? At the very moment the man was lying dead. I admit forging the check. But the money was for him. I just did it the easiest way. I, I didn't know he was dead. You did feed him the meal, after which he died two hours later. Oh, I didn't. I wasn't even there. But you heard Mrs. <laughs> Berman say she saw you feeding him an hour after the doctor left on Wednesday, <laughs> September 14th? He lied. Didn't you take arsenic out of this bottle and put it in ropes and food? No, that was Jimmy's bottle. I never handled it. Do <laughs> you deny that this is your blue handbag that the police took from you? Yes. That's mine, all right. Then how do you account for the arsenic crystals found in that bag? I don't know. Maybe the police put them there. They're all trying to frame me. That's all you may leave the stand. <laughs> They're all lies, I tell you. Lies, dear. Only Jimmy and me told the truth. <laughs> Strike that out. Davis, leave the stand. Your Honor, the defense rests. Your Honor, the state rests. We will hear the summation for the defense. Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this defendant is the victim of a chain of coincidences. She dealt with elderly men because they needed help with their affairs and investments, because they appreciated the kindness she could bring them. Not one tangible bit of evidence showed her actually administering arsenic to a single one of these men. No evidence has connected her with any purchase of arsenic. The only far-fetched link is the bottle used by her son's chemistry club. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, don't set that little child adrift. Don't take from that little boy the tender love he knew from his mother. You must, you will set her free. Your summation, Mr. District Attorney. Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you saw in this courtroom Fritz Luckner, who has been crippled and paralyzed by this defendant from her poisoned food, the only man who survived her poisonous doses. We showed you the bottle of arsenic found in her house. We showed you her handbag containing actual arsenic crystals. The doctor examined Jerome Rodson at 11 a.m., found him suffering from a slight cold. At noon, Mrs. Berman saw this at 2 o'clock. He was dead from the effects of arsenic poisoning. 
We have connected Clara Davis through evidence and motive with one, two, three, four, five poisonings. And I ask for your verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree without any recommendation for mercy. Amen. The judge will now charge the jury. All those desiring to leave the courtroom may do so. <laughs> the jury then retired to consider their verdict, and in a moment you'll hear the verdict of the jury as it was delivered in real life. Now, while the jury is out, let's do something similar to what a jury actually has to do in order to arrive at a verdict. Let's review the defense testimony. The first surprise was when the defense expert, Dr. Hunter, stated that... Uh, the symptoms of those elderly men who died, uh, those symptoms might have been caused by a variety of things other than arsenic poisoning. The defense apparently also considered it very significant when Jimmy Davis, 12-year-old son of the defendant, said that... That bottle of arsenic is mine. Our chemistry club collected old bottles at hospitals and drugstores throughout. That bottle was one of them. Mommy wouldn't do anything wrong. And you remember that the testimony regarding the bottle was corroborated by the defendant, Mrs. Clara Davis herself, when she testified that... I never saw that bottle of arsenic before. I told the police that it belonged to Jimmy, but they didn't believe me. If you were the jury, would you believe Mrs. Davis or not when she made those denials regarding the testimony against her? I did not write that will. I never saw it before. Never. I had nothing to do with the deaths of those other old men. It just happened that I handled their investments. The police are trying to frame me. I don't know why. I did not poison Fritz Luckner. Jimmy ate the same food. We ate the same food. And we weren't poisoned. They're trying to frame me. What do you think? If you were the jury, would you acquit Mrs. Davis or declare her guilty? And send her to the electric chair. Now, let's hear what the jury decided in real life. I return you to Radio Court Hall to hear the judge ask the jury's verdict. Mrs. Foreman, has the jury reached a verdict? Your Honor, we have. And how do you find? Your Honor, we, the jury, find Mrs. Clara Davis guilty of murder in the first degree. Without recommendation for mercy. As the verdict of guilty was pronounced, a police matron led Clara Davis back to her cell, and it was not until the door of her cell was open that she broke down and said, I can't believe they found me guilty. What will happen to my little boy, Jimmy, now? Mrs. Davis, isn't it a little too late to be thinking of that? According to the verdict, Mrs. Clara Davis died one year later in the electric chair. At the last moment, she confessed to her crimes. So ended this sensational, famous jury trial. Tune in next week and hear another thrilling, exciting, famous jury trial.